Hey everybody, good morning. It is Thursday morning, April the 6th, 2023, 11.19 in the morning, and we're here in Ezekiel chapter number 45 today. Uh, we're still in the middle of this temple discussion Today and tomorrow, we'll pretty much wrap up that, but then 47 and 48 are going to deal with the division of land. So go back to chapter 40 if you didn't see that one. That one's key to the entire last quarter of this book here, uh, Ezekiel, that is. So my personal opinion is this is the temple that Zerubbabel and Ezra should have built there are others who believe that it's simply symbolic and abstract. There are others that believe it's representative of a millennial temple that's supposed to be built. Others believe that it is symbolic of Christianity and the New Covenant. Uh, there's too many crossed wires here for me for those three things to be true and to be fair i don't have all the answers for what's happening here regarding this prince and david is mentioned as being the prince well we know that david will be around in the millennial temple i'm sorry the millennial uh during the millennium and he will uh be made king or prince over Israel again, but uh, we've got sacrifices being offered here, and we've got the divvying up of land and so forth, so it's really tough to figure this all out, and I'll just be honest with you, we mentioned it in the last day or two, when it comes to prophecy, I don't think anybody knows for sure and has all the answers, but we have a God who does, and so we don't have to really worry ourselves about it. On top of that, you have problems in your own life that have nothing to do with what Ezekiel's temple symbolizes. I think the best thing for Christians to do uh, is focus on the parts of Scripture that are relevant to them and their lives and their service for the Lord, and then let God take care of the rest of it. Basically, what all of this is, is the offer and, and promise of hope. That's all you got to take from it. God is telling Israel, hey, after this captivity is over, I'm bringing you back again. And he is giving them specific instructions on what he wants them to do. But um, I think personally, it's that uh, temple Zerubbabel built with Ezra uh, in tow that they didn't live up to. So anyways, my opinion's worth exactly what yours is, nothing. <laughs> Ezekiel 45, let's pray and we'll cover 25 verses here. Father, we love you. Help us as we go through again. I feel like I repeat myself sometimes and a bit redundant here, but we're doing our best and we pray for wisdom. We pray the Holy Spirit would guide and lead our thinking and understanding. We do this in Christ's name, amen. All right, Ezekiel 45, verse number one. Moreover, when ye shall divide by lot the land for inheritance, ye shall offer an oblation unto the Lord. That means a piece of land or a section of land. And holy portion of the land. The length shall be the length of five and twenty thousand reeds, and the breadth shall be ten thousand. This shall be holy in all the borders thereof round about. So God tells them when they go into the land again, and they start redistricting it. They're to take this section of land that he just measured out and set it aside for a specific purpose, and we'll learn that purpose in a minute. Verse 2, Of this there shall be for the sanctuary 500 in length and 500 in breadth, square round about, and 50 cubits round about for the suburbs thereof. And of this measure shalt thou measure the length of five and twenty thousand, and the breadth of ten thousand, and in it shall be the sanctuary in the most holy place. The holy portion of the land shall be for the priests, the ministers of the sanctuary, which shall come near to minister unto the Lord. And it shall be a place for their houses, and an holy place for the sanctuary. And the five and twenty thousand length of length, and the ten thousand of breadth, shall also the Levites, the ministers of the house, have for themselves, for a possession for twenty chambers. And ye shall appoint the possession of the city five thousand broad, and five and twenty thousand long, over against the oblation of the holy portion. It shall be for the whole house 
of Israel. So the purpose of this land is for the dwelling place of the priests. We know that the tribe of Levi received no specific inheritance when the Israelites first came into the land of promise, but they were given cities throughout those different areas. And in those cities, they were given land to occupy. And this is the same thing that's being given a little bit differently than prior, but still the same. God always takes care of his servants and uh, their portion is in him, the Bible says. Now, verse number seven, we shift gears away from this portion of land and we start to talk about uh, the portion for the prince. And this is probably the same prince that's being discussed prior. Uh, could it be David himself? We're not sure. We don't know. Verse 7. And a portion shall be for the prince on the one side and on the other side of the oblation of the holy portion and of the possession of the city before the oblation of the holy portion and before the possession of the city from the west side westward and from the east side eastward. And the length shall be over against one of the portions from the west border unto the east border. In the land shall be his possession in Israel, and my princes shall no more oppress my people, and the rest of the land shall they give to the house of Israel according to their tribes. Thus saith the Lord God, Let it suffice you, O princes of Israel. Remove violence and spoil, and execute judgment and justice. Take away your exactions from my people, saith the Lord God. Ye shall have just balances, and a just ephah, and a just bath. The ephah and the bath shall be of one measure, that the bath may contain the tenth part of an homer, and the ephah, the tenth part of an homer, the measure thereof shall be after the homer. And the shekel shall be twenty geras, twenty shekels, five and twenty shekels, fifteen shekels shall be your mene. This is the oblation that ye shall offer. The sixth part of an ephah of homer of wheat, and ye shall give the sixth part of an ephah of homer of barley. So let's go back. I should have stopped at verse 12. So verses 9 through 12, God is trying to reinstitute just weights and measures within his people. Uh, they started to rip each other off. We've talked about this in Proverbs and other places. Uh, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord. He doesn't want us stealing from each other or cheating each other. So if you've got a weight that says five kilograms, but it actually only weighs three kilograms, well, then you're stealing two kilograms from someone, right? And so he's resetting uh, the weights and measures for the people so that they'll treat each other honestly and justly. And, you know, as you go through life, you ought to be a truth teller. You ought to be an honest person with integrity and treat people fairly and justly. Verse 13. So really the rest of the chapter now, these 12 final verses, we already read 13, is talking about when you offer an offer of sacrifice to the Lord. Verse 14. Concerning the ordinance of oil, the bath of oil, ye shall offer the tenth part of the bath out of the core, which is an homer of ten baths, for ten baths are an homer. And one lamb out of the flock, out of two hundred, out of the fat pastures of Israel, for a meat offering, and for a burnt offering, and for peace offerings, to make reconciliation for them, saith the Lord God. All the people of the land shall give this oblation for the prince in Israel. And it shall be the prince's part to give burnt offerings, and meat offerings, and drink offerings, and the feasts, and in the new moons, and in the Sabbaths, and in all solemnities of the house of Israel. He shall uh, prepare the sin offering and the meat offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings to make reconciliation for the house of Israel. So the people were directed to give basically taxes to the prince so that he could then offer sacrifices to the Lord on their behalf. Verse 18, thus saith the Lord God, in the first month, in the first day of the month, thou shalt take a young bullock without blemish and cleanse the sanctuary. And the priest shall take of the blood of the sin offering and put it upon the posts of the house and upon the four corners of the settle of the altar and upon the posts of the gate of the inner court. And so thou shalt do the seventh day of the month for everyone that erreth and for him that is simple. 
so shall ye reconcile the house. If I'm not mistaken, that's the Passover feast. Yeah, in fact, here it is. In the first month, in the 14th day of the month, ye shall have the Passover, a feast of seven days. Unleavened bread shall be eaten. And upon that day shall the prince prepare for himself and for all the people of the land a bullock for a sin offering. And seven days of the feast he shall prepare a burnt offering to the Lord, seven bullocks and seven rams without blemish, daily for seven days, and a kid of the goats daily for a sin offering. And he shall prepare a meat offering of an ephah for a bullock and an ephah for a ram and for and an him hin of oil for an ephah. In the seventh month, in the fifteenth day of the month, shall he do like in the feast of the seven days, according to the sin offering, according to the burnt offering, and according to the meat offering, and according to the oil. And I know that doesn't mean a lot to you and I, but there's a reinstitution of the Passover here. And think about that as well. The Passover is a picture of Christ. He is the Lamb of God. But before he came, the spotless yearly lambs were selected and chosen and sacrificed, and the blood put on the doorposts. That was all pictures of Christ. So why is the instruction <coughs> to continue the Passover being done here if this is a millennial temple? That doesn't make any sense at all. Christ said it is finished. All those offerings are done away with. They were pictures and, and shadows of Christ, not something that has to be done after his sacrifice has been made. So I can't see this being millennial temple. Anyhow my opinion again. Thanks for watching. I know that wasn't all that exciting and thrilling, but it's interesting to consider these things. But in the end, you understand the Lord wants his people to have a relationship with him, and he wants you to have a relationship with him. And it's contingent upon our sins being forgiven and cleansed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, so that's our takeaway here from today. If you don't know Christ as Savior, uh, then please get in touch with us. Maybe send a, a comment or a direct message or something like that, and we can help you with that. All right, three days to go. I think today is Passover, isn't it? For Israel, does Passover start today? Uh, let's find out. Uh, I don't know if you care or not. I don't know why I'm doing this live, but uh, here we are. Uh, when is Passover 2023? The evening of Wednesday, April the 5th uh, through the evening of Thursday, April the 13th. So it started last night. Of course, Jewish days start with the evening and come to the morning. So sundown yesterday was the beginning of Passover in the United States, and it goes through next Thursday. All right, that's all I got for you. Thanks so much for watching. As always, please like, love, and share the post. Let people know that we're out here, and I will see you tomorrow for chapter 46. Three chapters to go, and we're done with Ezekiel. We move on to Revelation and finish it all up. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.